pretty decent. Uh, uh, it, it's it's a whole lot better than not having anything at all. So we appreciate to being able to do this and offer this to you like this. So I'm going to uh, introduce our speaker, uh, who is uh, Dr. Glenn Thackeray, who is professor at the Department of Geosciences, Idaho State University. Um, he um, is has degrees from uh, Beloit College, University of Oregon, University of Washington. Um, that degree, his PhD, was acquired in 1996, and he has been at uh, Idaho State um, ever since. So his uh, research interests uh, are primarily in quaternary, which is to say recent geology, Western North America, New Zealand. Um, if he can get into New Zealand, that might be a challenge these days. Um, uh, chronology, climatic forcing, Pleistocene glaciation, and he's looked at that in the northern basin range and in the Teton range here, uh, hydrogeology and other things. And he teaches a whole suite of courses to uh, aspiring earth scientists at Idaho State and has a very, very long list of publications. So we're not going to unmute um, the uh, everybody's microphone, but I would ask you all the same to join me in welcoming uh, Glenn Thackeray. Glenn, you're up. Share your, so go. All right, you can hear me, I take it. And I'm gonna mutter to myself for a moment while I share my screen and then uh, I need to plug in a mouse at some point shortly here so I don't, um, I don't keep screwing up my screen. So bear with me just a second. Um, and uh, actually, let me, I, I say I was gonna mutter to myself. I'll talk without my slides for just a moment. And, uh, and I, will, uh, I will echo what, what John said a few minutes ago. Um, it, is, um, it is difficult uh, or different. It's very different doing these sorts of things as is teaching and all sorts of uh, activities that we normally take for granted that we can, um, that we can do in person and then um, that we can do in person and then, uh, excuse me just a second, that, that we can normally do in, in person. And, um, but as John said, it's way better than uh, not doing it at all. And uh, that's, that was certainly the case with our classes the second half of the semester here. So uh, I'm glad to see so many people tapping in and uh, um, I'll, uh, I'll do the best I can to keep, uh, keep you entertained. Uh, it is very different uh, talking in an empty room and, um, uh, and not, uh, not, wonder, not uh, being able to uh, uh, discern people's body language and uh, hear whether people have laughed at the dumb jokes and stuff, but I'll, I'll do the best I can. So. Um, so let me uh, let me share my screen, and there's a uh, there's a view here that um, that many of you may be familiar with, and uh, hopefully there's not a black band across my screen, the top of my screen. I think it's clear now. So um, uh, my my talk uh, my title may seem a little bit uh, a little bit odd. What the heck is artist and fault trenching? Well, I'll define that in a little bit. Um, and, uh, and really what, what we've been working on the last several years is the recent geologic history of the, of the Teton Fault. The Teton Fault has a long history going back uh, several million years, uh, five to 10 million years, six to nine million years, something of that order. The very deep basin at the foot of the range and a very high range at the, uh, above the basin, obviously. And, uh, and so it's been active for a long time, but we're really looking at the very recent record. And, uh, and John mentioned that I study the quaternary period, which is the last two and a half million years of Earth history. And, uh, and that gets us into the, the Earth's surface world, meaning that um, we, uh, we have a long and rich geologic record in the Teton Range going back more than two and a half billion years ago. Um, uh, similar actually to some of the rocks that I cut my teeth on as an undergrad in Minnesota, but uh, much better exposed here. And, uh, and we have a long history of geology and of all sorts of processes in the Teton Range 
but really we're interested in the um, in the the impact of the <clears throat> of the fault itself on this range and what we can learn about um, how the how the fault helps shape the landscape and of course how the fault presents earthquake hazards and um, and so what I'm going to talk about is uh, a, a, a bit of background on 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 my own uh, my own background, a bit of background on the Teton Fault, and then I'll talk about things that we're actually working on right now. So, um, let's see if I can advance my screen. Okay, it's always important to uh, talk about who else is responsible for this. Um, no one person could do all of this, and. Uh, the main people that I've worked with over the last several years in the Tetons are Mark Zellman, who is a consultant in Golden, Colorado, uh, Chris Duras and Ryan Gold, and, and quite a number of other people from the U.S. Geological Survey uh, Paleoseismology Group in Golden. Uh, Darren Larson from Occidental College has been working on lake records in the Tetons for many years, and uh, he is part of our broader NSF-funded project. Uh, Joe Lachardi as well has been working on the uh, dating the the landforms uh, left by the glaciers, working with Ken Pierce and others uh, for many years in the Tetons, and uh, and with uh, with Joe's work, we can get a lot of the the uh, a sense of the longer record of the fault, and with Darren's work as well. And I'll I'll touch on each of those. I know that Darren spoke uh, with this group uh, a year ago, I think, or so. And I'm not sure if Joe, sure if Joe has, but um, I'm not going to delve too much into their work. But but the work that they're doing is really important relative to the work that uh, that uh, 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 several of us are are doing in terms of fault trenching. I've had a couple of graduate students, Kyla Grasso and Amy Staley, work in the Tetons. Emily Janoski was a, a Bachelor of Science student who uh, who worked with Kyla in the Tetons last summer. And then uh, too many people to mention that have helped um, with our trenching operations. So um, I also want to mention that uh, you, you don't do a project like this without a base of a lot of information. Um, lots of people have worked in the Tetons. I don't need to go through, uh, through all of these, but uh, from the Hayden surveys to current work with the University of Kentucky group, uh, people from uh, federal agencies, Bob Smith from Utah, uh, Ken Pierce from the USGS and Bozeman, of course, has worked in Jackson Hole for a long time, and uh, the great David Love, who worked in the, the uh, western Wyoming, I guess all of Wyoming, for about 60 years. So um, lots of people have worked in the Tetons and, and far more than I've, uh, than I've mentioned here. Okay, a little bit about my background. Um, I've worked in, in various places around the West on, on various uh, types of projects, but a lot of what I study is what is in the, uh, the picture on the right here. And uh, that is a picture I took of the Tetons about uh, 20,000 years ago. And, um, and uh, that is, uh, that's the image that I want to uh, plant in your minds of uh, of a glacier coming down a very uh, uh, deeply carved valley. This is actually in New Zealand. It's the modern, the modern equivalent of a lot of uh, Teton glaciers. Different setting, but but uh, good nonetheless. And um, and what we see is a, a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of gravel in the uh, in the river valley here. This is the Franz Josef Glacier, and uh, there's there's outwash gravel, the the meltwater deposit gravel out in front. And then just this jumbled mess of gravel and, and finely ground rock out in front of the glacier. And the glaciers retreated up valley a fair bit in the last couple of decades. But it leaves behind a very irregular pile of debris where, uh, in the area where it used to be. And that's a lot of the stuff that I work on. This is a very recent deposit. This is a, uh, this is a pile of debris that's no older than 20 years. And... Um, and I tend to work on, uh, on these sorts of sediments in the recent geologic record. So mostly in the last uh, 100,000 years or so. So a couple places, a few places I've worked, the Olympic Peninsula, I worked as a consultant in Oregon years ago and, and that's what actually got me into studying the quaternary. I've done a lot of work in central Idaho and continue to work there. Uh, the, uh, the Tetons, of course, a bit on the Snake River Plain, uh, southeastern Idaho near Pocatello, 
a little bit in northern Nevada years ago. And, uh, and then uh, I've done a lot of work in New Zealand, uh, pretty much the, the, the uh, various places from the northern tip of the South Island to about two thirds of the way down the island. We've, we've done a whole series of projects there and uh, hoping to get back there at some point uh, when they allow people in and uh, do some more work down there at some point. And then a little bit of work in Tasmania and in Wales and so forth. But mostly I study these sorts of, of, uh, of surficial deposits, the landforms that, uh, that mantle mountain fronts especially, that tell us in this case about the history of the glaciers, but because a lot of mountain ranges in the Western US have been glaciated, when we look at, look for fault records, we're often looking in these sorts of deposits that were deposited directly by the glacier or by the meltwater streams out in front of the glacier. And, and, and that's, the, that's the record that we tend to see. And uh, the sediments are very young, 20,000 years and younger in many cases. So we get a good record of faulting since that time. So that's a lot of what we look at. And then I also claim to be a sedimentologist. I do a lot of stratigraphy and sedimentation. This is on the, the coast of Washington. Um, and uh, these are all glacial sediments exposed in these beautiful sea cliffs along the coastline. And uh, I've worked there a couple of times in, uh, in my career. So um, I uh, gained a little infamy amongst some of my geologist friends a few weeks ago. And uh, I did not choose the, uh, the, the subtitle of this article in the Washington Post, but on uh, March 31st, of course, there was a sizable earthquake in central Idaho. It was a 6.5 magnitude earthquake. Um, there have been a lot of aftershocks in that area. I talked with the mayor of Stanley just yesterday about where this might be going. And as with many earthquake events, the answer is, well, it could do this and it could do that. And uh, they've had about 900 aftershocks there of uh, 1.5 magnitude and larger, they are just getting shaken quite a lot. And um, it's a, it was a little bit of a stretch for this report. That I thought the reporter was, was, uh, was really insightful, but I tried to convince him not to use the, the line that I had predicted this earthquake because I absolutely hadn't predicted this earthquake. I did not see this earthquake coming. And, uh, but what I did there um, uh, about a decade ago was uh, I, uh, along with Dave Rogers and uh, David Strutker and, and uh, a couple of other people, found the, the, uh, the surface expression of the sawtooth fault. Until that time, we didn't know if that fault was active. And very quickly, we did know that it was. And, and uh, we did a project up there over the course of a few years. Uh, we have some lake records of uh, seismic events, apparent seismic events. And, uh, and so that was the Sawtooth Fault, which is the equivalent of the Teton Fault in, uh, in central Idaho near the town of Stanley. And, uh, and this earthquake occurred near that fault and might have involved a small portion of that fault, but mostly wasn't the Sawtooth Fault. So, um, and I, uh, but what we did 10 years ago is we told people up there uh, two things. Number one was, uh, you need, to, you need to get out of this place and sell me your property really cheap, really fast. They didn't do that. And uh, since they didn't do that, I made the point that you live in earthquake country, you know this, uh, you now know this, and the things that you need to do are the things that people in earthquake country do, which is to bolt the bookcases to the wall, take those beautiful heavy rocks off the top shelf of the bookcase so they don't fall on you if there's an earthquake. And, and uh, hopefully a few people did those things, those sorts of common sense things in Stanley. And there wasn't a lot of damage up there, but, um, but uh, we, we did make people there aware of the earthquake hazard. And, and really a lot of what I'm going to talk about tonight is the same sort of common sense for Jackson Hole. I'm not gonna reveal any alarming new evidence that says that there's about to be an earthquake or anything like that. Um, we're really looking at the, at the 20,000 year and really the 10,000 year history of the, of the Teton Fault so that we can understand what that hazard is. And uh, so, um, so hopefully um, this talk uh, clarifies some of the, of, the, uh, of the earthquake hazard in Jackson Hole um, and, uh, and maybe convinces a few more people to 
uh, to prepare their house just in case it happens and um, and uh, and not just the the initial earthquake but possibly uh, uh, many many aftershocks as we've seen in the region recently so there's that so uh, here's what we found in the Tetons this is the the uh, the, the Teton range or sorry the, the sawtooth range is off the left side of the image here this is a LIDAR image, which is an airborne laser scanning uh, technique that uh, allows us to map the Earth's surface in, in fine detail. And the dream for any geomorphologist who studies landforms to remove the vegetation. This is a very heavily treed landscape. We can digitally remove the vegetation and see what's underneath. And marked out by these blue arrows is what we saw when we first got this, this image, and that is a line cutting across all this topography, across all this landscape, and that is the Sawtooth Fault, and uh, has some uh, distinct similarities to the Teton Fault, and this is what told, it, what told us that there is a, an apparent um, earthquake hazard in that area. So uh, that's what we found there. Now, uh, fast forward uh, about, um, uh, to about uh, seven years ago, I was uh, giving my first talk with the geologist of Jackson Hole. I was actually talking about the glaciers in the Teton Range. And, um, and uh, the morning after the talk, I was uh, uh, with John Heberger at his house, and he pulled up the, a LIDAR image, very similar to this one, um, from the, uh, the, the Earthscope uh, LIDAR data set that was collected in the, um, uh, the, two, early, uh, the late 2000s. And, uh, and, and what, I, what I noticed, and what I guess what John really pointed out is that uh, the fault scarp is very obvious. There's the Teton Fault just trundling right across the landscape. And uh, what caught my eye is that the fault scarp is fairly, uh, fairly small in comparison in the valley floors, which we know are about 15,000 years old. Um, this valley floor is about 15, thousand years old. We know that from the work of Joe Lichardi and, and Ken Pierce and from dating the glacial sequences. But then you step up onto this moraine and this is a pile of debris left by the glacier as is all this, this stuff out here. And, um, but if you, look at, uh, if you look up here, this scarp is very high. The fault is very high, which suggests that that landform has been there longer and has seen more earthquake events. Every earthquake event Fault moves about two meters and uh, about uh, seven feet, and uh, and that adds up over time. So we might have six events down here, and uh, maybe fifteen or twenty events up in uh, uh, th that are recorded in this older landform up here, and uh, and I'll come back around to this later. But this is really what this image is really what got me started in the Tetons and uh, it evolved from there. And it's uh, it's been a really fun place to work with. Uh, with some great co-workers and, uh, and of course there's a lot of interest in this particular fault. So I'll come back to that story in a little bit. So obviously a Teton fault has created a wall of mountains and uh, there was topography here before the Teton fault. It was a laramide uplift of, uh, of about 60 million years ago, um, plus or minus. And, uh, and there is a fault along the range front. That's the fault, the fault scarp is buried in the trees along here, which is another reason that LIDAR is such a good technique. It allows us to see uh, across a broad landscape without trees. Uh, it's better than burning down the forest or cutting it um, in a place like this, obviously. And, uh, and that, um, that fault separates the range from the structural basin. And, and we think of Jackson Hole as being very flat, and the reason is that it's very flat. And uh, but that's just the sediments at the surface. That's the mostly the gravels of the of the glaciers, the meltwater uh, deposited gravels. So Jackson Hole is pretty darn flat, and of course the iconic landscape is the faulted landscape. So the Teton Fault has moved the range up and dropped the basin down and erosional processes. This is not the fault right here. This is a bedrock surface that is expressing the fault. It's been eroded a fair amount, but, um, but the topography that we see here is very much the topography of a very active range front. This is going up quickly. The left side is dropping down quickly and the glaciers and the rivers and the storms and the rock falls 
um, are, are working away at that range. As it rises, the erosional processes are trying to take it down and, and causing this very beautifully carved um, uh, topography. So um, turning into the Google Earth view, which allows us to do just about anything, uh, the last picture, of course, was looking south from Jackson Lake at the Tetons, that oblique view. And, uh, and here we are with the Tetons now to the left. Jackson Hole to the right, you'll recognize uh, Lee Lake, Jenny Lake. Uh, that should be, nope, that's uh, Phelps Lake, Taggart Lake in here. And uh, so there's that flat floor of Jackson Hole. And so Jackson Hole is a structural basin. These rocks in the, in the Gravant Range are, um, are underneath this valley several, several kilometers down, a long way down, and that has been filled in with sediment. And some of the work that David Love did years ago was had to do with uh, Jackson Hole filling in as the fault was active, a, a spectacular story that he put together uh, quite some time ago. So um, from the, uh, the book by Smith and Siegel, the, um, the, the regional uh, geologic landscape book with such great diagrams, uh, beautiful artwork in here that shows us the Teton Range separated from the fault, uh, by the fault, from its basin. There are the older rocks that are way high in the Tetons. They're way down beneath the basin, extending off into the, um, into the Gravant Range. And then, uh, and then the basin has been filled in with sediment. Conglomerate, limestone, gravels, cobbles, some volcanic ash in there, presumably uh, alluvium, so the river gravels. And, and so that's the picture that we need to have. And so we're really looking at the very youngest of the sediments along, and the fault itself along the range front. And uh, I'm looking at my clock now and figuring I better, uh, better get moving. Um, I'll, I'm gonna skip over this part, uh, in fact. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit and uh, so this is a uh, classic artistic image of, uh, of Yellowstone. I love this image. Um, looking from the Yellowstone, above the Yellowstone Plateau in the historic, as I suppose, uh, looking to the southwest toward the Tetons. And this is the, I like to look at this as the glacier's eye view. Hey, Glenn? Yeah. Sorry, sorry to interrupt you. I heard something rustle, and it sounds like you muted yourself, sort of. Oh, hold on. That again. All right, better now. Go ahead. Okay, I think there was a uh, uh, there was a custodian's cart upstairs, or some furniture being dragged upstairs. I'm in our geology department right now, so uh, that might have uh, messed up my microphone. Thank you, John. Please do interrupt me if uh, if my voice disappears, or you'll just be looking at a slideshow. Um, so anyway, there's the Teton Range. This is Jackson Lake here, Jenny Lake, or uh, Lee Lake, I suppose, Jenny Lake down there. And so this is the glacier's eye view of ice that accumulated on the Yellowstone Plateau and extended many places, but extended uh, down through the Jackson Lake Basin, along the Snake River, down through the Jackson Lake Basin, and, uh, and in the last glaciation, just to the southern end of Jackson Lake, which is defined by the debris of the glacier. In the previous Bull Lake glaciation, it went way south beyond Jackson, of course. And that's a, a story that Ken Pierce and Joe Lichardi have put together over, uh, over many years. And uh, I won't talk about that much. But um, here is what Yellowstone looked like 20,000 years ago. If you uh, get into a 757 and fly backwards around the, uh, around the globe 20,000 times, you get to see Yellowstone like this otherwise known as the Kenai Peninsula in Alaska in this case. But this is about what Yellowstone would have looked like with, uh, with glaciers heading off to the south toward the Tetons down here and heading off to the east into the Absarica Range and so forth. So, so that's the image we have to have of Yellowstone. In terms of the fault record, um, here is the, uh, an image of the Yellowstone ice cap. There's these beautiful illustrations in, the, in a recent paper by uh, Lichardi and Pierce. Um, on the chronology of glaciation. And there's Jackson Hole just there. That would be Jackson Lake beneath the, the word Teton and Range. And, uh, and so there's the Yellowstone ice cap, the mountain ice cap that flowed down into Jackson Hole. And one of the things that that leaves us is it leaves us a surface, a land surface, that we know is about 14,000 years old. These, these, uh, these strips 
along northern Jackson Lake. I'll talk about this area in a little bit. Right in this area, uh, we have a set of trenches here. And uh, these strips are, um, are, are uh, uh, grooves and, uh, and flutes, if you will, carved by the Yellowstone ice cap. And that tells us that this fault has developed since 14,000 years. On the front of the Tetons, there are a lot of glacial uh, landforms that are about 15,000 years old. And that tells us a lot about the history of the fault over the last 15,000 years there. So the glacial record is very important. Okay, so at the broad scale wall of mountains, the, uh, the, but at a finer scale, the fault scarp is expressed in places like this. This is uh, looking across to the northwest shore of Jenny Lake. Uh, this, uh, these steps in the landscape are partly glacial landforms. There are some landslides up in here and, uh, and, and partly the fault. I'll, uh, I'll give you another image of that in just a moment. Um, and that's right here. So this is in the, the marshy basin uh, just up valley of Taggart Lake off the trail there. And, uh, and there's a boulder up there. And, uh, and so uh, when I took this picture, I was standing on a surface, this uh, vegetated surface down here. The same land surface is also up here. So the step in the landscape, if we walk along this surface, we have to climb up 12.4 meters, about 30 plus feet, 38 feet or so, up to the same surface up there. That is the expression of the Teton Fault since 15,000 years ago. And uh, so I'm going to outline it here, I hope, um, if I can get it to forward. So there's the fault scarp from here up to here and 12.4 meters. Typical slip is two meters per earthquake. So we would uh, calculate simple math, about six events in the last, uh, um, in the last 14,000 years, 15,000 years or so in this, in this place. And, uh, and there's, a, there's a lot that we've, uh, we've done to try to sort out those, uh, those parts of the story. So it's been studied for a long time. Um, what do we need to know? We need to know how frequently it ruptures because that is what tells us about how likely an earthquake is. How big are the earthquakes? That's a very important piece of information. I'll get back to that in a little bit. Not that I'm going to say well, you're gonna have an earthquake this big, but. Uh, we have ways of constraining that. How long has it been since the last earthquake? This is very important because that tells us how long the fault has been loading up. And related questions, does the whole fault rupture at once or does it rupture in pieces? That, that has a big effect on how big the earthquake is and also how frequent the earthquakes are. So does it go all at once or does it break in pieces separately? Um, and we have some partial answers on that now. Uh, and does the frequency of earthquakes change over time? And I'll, I'll address the first one um, uh, sooner, and then I'll, I'll get into some of these other questions where we can put specific timing on things. So back to this diagram, uh, what, I, uh, what I said uh, in a paper a few years ago is these moraines up here must be older. They must be a lot older than 15,000 years. We knew the age of this from, from Joe Lachardi and Ken Pierce's work. This must be a much older because it, it, it has this much higher scarp. And uh, so how do we do that? Well, one thing is we can, uh, we can go to boulders on those landforms. This is Joe Lachardi here. He's at University of New Hampshire. He's been working on this sort of thing for a number of years. This boulder was dumped by a glacier here some time ago and we wanna know how long ago that happened. What Joe is doing is he's going at the top of this boulder with a hammer and chisel and uh, collecting the top inch of that rock, which has been bombarded by cosmic radiation ever since it was set down there by the glacier. We can measure isotopes in the, in the quartz in that rock that accumulate only in this way. And we can calculate how long that rock has been exposed to cosmic radiation. It seems weird but it works, works quite well. Once, once we got some of the details worked out, uh, it works quite well. And, uh, and Joe's been doing this for a long time. And, uh, and so uh, we knocked the top off that, and a few other boulders, and uh, this is, is still unpublished information. Joe has a, a paper coming together on, on dating a whole uh, sequence of these, these higher features along here, these higher moraine features 
from the glaciers. We got four ages here, and the answer is that these lateral moraines are several years older than the than these features out here and the the, the valley floor here. So several thousand years older, not as old as I had thought. The, the uh, calculations of the height of this scarp we've redone recently. I have a graduate student who defended about three weeks ago, Kyla Grasco, Grasso, and, uh, and the scarp isn't quite as high as it looks. And I won't get into the details of that, but uh, it, it looks like this is not, the scarp is not as outlandish as we thought. It's not quite as, doesn't represent as much fault offset as we thought. And, uh, and it is somewhat older, but not quite as old as I thought. So that will be coming out fairly soon. And uh, I'm always happy to uh, cast aspersions on, on my own work because I know I'm safe doing that. Um, and uh, and uh, then uh, Darren Larson, who's at Occidental College and uh, has been a, uh, back and forth into the uh, Jackson Hole area for many years, uh, taught at Teton Science School, I think, uh, many years ago. And, uh, he teaches at Occidental College in California now. And, uh, and he's been doing a lot of work in the lakes. So he goes into the lakes and he uh, drives a pipe into the bottom of the lake, like Jenny Lake here, and gets a tube of mud out of it. You go to the bottom of the lake and there's a lot of mud, oddly enough. And, uh, and so this, the moraine, the, the uh, hill that holds that in, the glacial hill, there is, is about 14,000 years old. So the glacier retreated across the basin. So if you can get down to the bottom of the mud, you get about 14,000 years of record. The really nice thing about lake sediments is the, the timing can be nailed down with very high precision because we can use radiocarbon dating, carbon-14 dating in these sediments and, and determine how old this, uh, this particular layer is. And, and Darren is a master at that technique. The other thing is this is a very sensitive archive of disturbance. If an earthquake occurs on here, on the fault, it's very likely that part of the, the uh, lake uh, shoreline will collapse and uh, the sediment will go into the lake and be deposited where, uh, where Darren has gotten these cores. And so in the lake bottom, there are turbidite deposits. These are our gravity flow deposits. There are landslides into the lake as well, very large landslides from the, uh, from the, the uh, landforms around. But here are two turbidites in the Jenny Lake core. Here's one that's 8.3 thousand years and one that's 7.7 thousand years. If those are seismically generated, that means that those are individual earthquakes. Now I wanna be very careful about that because there are a number of ways that these can uh, form. And, uh, and one is if the delta gets very heavily loaded with sediment, it could collapse. I don't know that, I don't think that's what's going on here, but also <clears throat> any shaking on the Teton fault, of course, could cause that to happen. But there are other faults in the region that can cause uh, strong shaking. And so we may have a, a record of earthquakes here. Maybe every one of these is an earthquake. There's a very good possibility of that. And, uh, and here's the record. So 14,000 years back here, geologists, we can never get, get together on, on which way the time scale should go, but this is 16,000 years at the left to modern sediment at the right. And, uh, and so each of these gray bars is a layer like this. And so if these are each earthquakes, it looks like there were a lot of earthquakes until about 7.8 thousand years, and then just one fairly weak one about 5.3 thousand years ago, which becomes very important later on, and, uh, and then nothing that has happened on the floor of Jenny Lake except mud deposition since 5.3 thousand years. So hold on to that age, because we're gonna come back to that later. Turns out to be very intriguing. And uh, so if we read this as an earthquake history of the Teton Fault, which it may be, or of regional earthquakes, there would have been a lot of earthquakes in the first that few thousand years after the glaciers retreated from the basin, and then one earthquake in the last uh, seven and a half thousand years. So, uh, so that's one record. These are very different records from what I'm going to talk about the rest of the time here. So there's a lot that we're trying to pull together 
uh, Darren and Joe and, and uh, Mark and Chris Duras and others and I are working together to try to pull this together. So um, let's move on. I promised you artisan trenching. So um, I, I want to talk about the, the Teton Fault um, in its entire length. Jackson Lake obviously is up here, Teton Range to the west. This is a map that we published 2019, uh, Wyoming Geological Survey put it out. And uh, this is based on that LIDAR uh, imagery of the, of the range front. We remapped the fault scarps as best they could be marked, as best they could be mapped from, uh, from way up at uh, Polecat Creek to the north on the, in the parkway uh, section of the, um, of the, the, um, the range front. Uh, down through the Steamboat Mountain area, along Jackson Lake, um, along uh, around uh, Lee Lake, Jenny Lake, there's Taggart and Bradley Lakes, Phelps Lake, Granite Canyon down here, and then uh, the fault splits as it approaches Teton Pass, continues along the range front uh, uh, near Wilson, and also part of it uh, splits west into uh, Phillips Canyon area where we dug a trench last year. So. Um, here's a, a section of that map in the, um, uh, in the Jenny Lake area. You can see the detail that we were able to pull out there. Um, I want to mention um, uh, this guy, Rick Zeeb, uh, who did the design on the map. We, we did, uh, we did the, the technical side of mapping, but Rick is a, is a uh, very talented um, cartographer. And, uh, and I, heard, um, I heard just last week that this map um, that uh, Rick had uh, submitted it to a uh, competition called the Atlas of Design. This is a, a biannual publication of the, the North American Cartographic Information Society. They select a series of nicely done maps, and this one is selected for the 2020 uh, version. Who would have known? So, uh, so anyway, that's our new map of the fault, and I'll, I'll keep at it, um, keep with this for a little bit. So one question is, how long is the fault? Our answer is not the same as everybody else's answer, 72 kilometers. We draw the line northeast of, uh, of Jackson Lake, right up here for a variety of reasons. Uh, these faults are quite different up here and, and we're getting up toward the Yellowstone Caldera where things get quite different in terms of the faults. So we draw the line up here and then right down around Teton Pass there's some discussion about uh, scarps just south of, um, of Teton Pass Highway, but um, uh, 72 kilometers, about 43 miles from, uh, from north to south. Question is, does 72 kilometers of fault break all at once in an earthquake, or do we get this part breaking, and then this part breaking, and then maybe the central part breaking? And, and that's, a, that's a, 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 an open question, and that's why we've been out digging trenches. One way that we know the earthquake history of a place like this is we dig trenches in faults. This is the coin of the realm in paleo-seismology, the study of past earthquakes. We need to be able to dig into the fault and date the sediments that are cut by the fault directly and therefore know the, the, uh, the fault history. Um, up until recently, there was just one trench that Bob Smith and John Bird uh, excavated at Granite Creek down here in the late 80s, I believe, uh, 1989, uh, published in 1995. Uh, 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 this, this would be John Bird's uh, PhD dissertation from the University of Utah. There's also a, a, a geophysical research paper uh, from 1994 uh, that John and, and Bob and some others put out. So we needed more trenches because this is representing what's happening in the south. Question is what's happening in the rest of the fault? So uh, this is not a great place for fault trenching. There's a number of, there are a number of reasons for that. The fault is mainly in a national park and rightly so we are sensitive about disturbance of the ground in national parks, goes without saying. There's no road access anyway to the fault um, in the places it needs to be trenched. And uh, the general rule of thumb is that you need a backhoe, you need backhoe access for fault trenching. And, uh, and most, People who study faults in this way would say, absolutely, you need a backhoe so you can uh, get in there and dig a proper hole in the ground. We beg to differ. And so this is what artisan fault trenching is. The term artisan is used appropriately in some cases. Uh, used in a lot of ways that, uh, maybe it should be, but uh, including this one. Probably. Hey, Glenn, the, the same thing happened again, sound-wise. Okay. Let there me, we go. Uh, 
Can you hear me? Yep, good now. Okay. There's, uh, okay, I need to get back. Okay, I need to just get back into, oh, not that one, sorry. I always warn my students I'm gonna mutter to myself for a few minutes while I uh, share my screen and that's because I know myself all too well. Okay, so here we are. So let me uh, define artisan fault trenching. We use uh, technology and some techniques from the Iron Age forward to dig holes in the ground. And uh, what that really means is a, uh, a classic hi-ho, hi-ho moment as we uh, carry our, um, our uh, heavy tools off to work in the, in the woods. So this is up near uh, Jackson Lake at Steamboat Mountain a few years ago. And uh, we're just carrying uh, hand tools into the back country here, or the side country, I guess. And, uh, and we, um, we dig by hand. There's, there's not, never going to be a backhoe getting into this spot. This is where we needed to dig the trench in the best possible spot. So we go in and do it by hand. And people think we're crazy. Um, each of these trenches is about five to six tons of, uh, of sediment moved but it works and, um, and we can get at the fault history from this. This is at Steamboat Mountain. And see our beautiful uh, rack that we built just here with uh, scrap wood from around the site. And uh, these are our tarps with the spoils from the trench there. And uh, we, we had to put tarps over it because it rained quite a bit that week and uh, we don't want a mud puddle in the bottom. So we can make trenches in this way. Uh, here's the iconic trench um, at Antelope Flat with the Teton Range in the in the foreground. This is a, 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 a side fault of the Teton Fault at Antelope Flat, and uh, and so here are two people in that uh, in that fault trench with their head sticking up above the the uh, fault trench. We don't go into these things until we know they're stable. And uh, um, the gravels out in Antelope Flat, as it turns out, are very well cemented with. Uh, with calcite from that the soils are deposited there. And those were some of the most stable trenches we've had. So we're very careful about how we do this. So um, we've, done, uh, we've done this. Um, first of all, what do we get? We get an exposure of the fault. Um, I'll come back to this in a little bit. The fault is right here, the Teton Fault. And, um, and uh, there are sediments to the right, sediments to the left, and I'll explain that in a couple of minutes. So we've done this. Um, at uh, Steamboat Mountain, at Lee Lake. Uh, there's the old trench at Grand Canyon from Granite Canyon that I mentioned from 1989. There was a big machine dug, dug trench. Uh, I've taken to calling machine dug trenches brutalist trenches. And, uh, and then down at Ski Lake more recently, and there's uh, Antelope Flats uh, where that uh, picture was, was taken uh, in the upper right. So we've done several of these. We go in and we dig two trenches usually. And uh, Buffalo Bowl was important because it was at the ski area. It was disturbed ground and uh, could be dug. And the USGS did a big project there a, uh, uh, three years ago, I guess now, and uh, got back through three, the last three events of the, the last three ruptures of the Teton Fault. Everywhere else we get back through one and in some cases two events. And that tells us a lot. So, um, so here we are digging at Lee Lake. I don't need to go into this too much. We go for small scarps. We don't want to try to dig the big scarps. That'd be crazy. This is all crazy anyway. But about a two meter scarp in this spot at Lee Lake. And we did another spot like it uh, with a different uh, fault scarp of a similar height. So, uh, so this is what we get. We get a shallow trench, in this case about four feet deep. These are glacial sediments back in here. These are sediments that have fallen into the hole created by the fault. There's a glacial boulder. You can see our, uh, our flag pins in the wall here, marking various, uh, various units. So that's what we get. Here is that uh, Steamboat Mountain Trench. Uh, this is glacial sediment back here. This is sediment that is filled in the hole formed by the, uh, by the fault itself. And you can see our notes on here, uh, pointing out various uh, animal burrows. And, and uh, there's a note here that you might be able to read that says, this is not a kimberlite. Somebody was being very funny that day. And uh, so there are no diamonds in that area, if you, if you were wondering. Okay, so that's what we get. And, um, 
And uh, that site is up here at, uh, in the Steamboat Mountain area, way up here. Uh, there's the site along uh, Jackson Lake. There's the shore of Jackson Lake. This is looking northeast. The beautiful thing here is the Teton Fault swings away from the range front and it, uh, it actually climbs, as we move north, climbs this slope. And right where A and B are is where we dug our trenches, the, uh, the fault is trapping sediment coming out of these drainages. So it was a beautiful place to geologically to dig a, a, a fault trench and uh, capture those sediments that have come down and bury the fault. That's what gives us our, our knowledge of timing. So here is that fault scarp. Glacial sediment here, and the sediment that is, uh, here's the fault right here. This is the, this is the, the expression of the fault in the trench, um, and that is right here. And, uh, and, and I'll, I'll uh, give you an analogy for that, but this is the, the original sediment. This is the fault separating the original sediment from the sediment that is filled in there. And, and this is what we're looking for. And, uh, and I'll, I'll call your attention to these two pink wedges here, and I'll uh, come back to those in a couple of minutes. So if we want to understand this, this is the fault right here. It's been buried. And, uh, and this is the eroded fault uh, stepping back here. So this is still glacial sediment. This is not glacial sediment out here. So what we get is um, we get something like this. This is over, over in central Idaho at Bora Peak. This is the 1983 fault scarp. Ever since then, the fault has been the fault face. The, the expression of the fault at the surface has been uh, eroding down off of there. This is, is, has been cutting back, and that's been filling in just at the bottom of the, of the, uh, the, the fault scarp. So the fault scarp extended all the way down to here. This sediment is falling off of here and accumulating down here. And over time, the fault, the fault scarp lays back and we get a deposition of sediment right on top of the fault. And so if we go, and that's called a colluvial wedge. Colluvium is just hill slope debris. And uh, so if we go back here, there's our fault. This is one colluvial wedge that has buried the fault. This is another colluvial wedge that buried an earlier rupture of the fault. And then uh, you can see ages on here of various points in the, um, uh, in the sediment. So 12.4 thousand years on the glacial sediment, 8.6 thousand years in here, 5.2 thousand years, et cetera. And, and these numbers go into determining when this, this fault last ruptured. Okay, so, uh, so there's, there's your, um, uh, your sediment. We use radiocarbon. There's a lot of charcoal in these sediments. So we can use radiocarbon carbon-14 dating, and uh, luminescence dating allows us to date the timing since uh, sediment was buried, which is a depositional age, more or less. And uh, so we do everything we can to date that colluvial wedge. I'm going to uh, skip forward here. This is a trench in, um, uh, at Lee Lake. Same thing. There's a colluvial wedge there. Uh, there was another colluvial wedge that overlies that. So in this case, the colluvial wedges are in yellow. So we date those. This is a messy diagram that shows us each of the radiocarbon and luminescent states that we have. And this tells us, this is a, a, a compilation of those that tells us that there were two earthquakes. Lee Lake one, about 6,000 years ago, 5.9 plus or minus, uh, 5.9 thousand years plus or minus 700 years, we should read that a rather broad constraint on that one. This one uh, was constrained much more tightly, 10,000 years plus or minus a couple hundred years, uh, and that is an expression of these ages. So that's what we're doing. Um, uh, Lee Lake Two is represented here. It was cut by the more recent um, event. So Lee Lake Two, the earlier event, 10,000 years, and then one right around 6,000 years that cut that again. All right, so those are the ages at Lee Lake. And uh, we put them on a time scale like this. And, and you'll see various expressions of this. So uh, here is the, here's what we have so far. And, uh, and, and I'm getting, getting right toward the end here. And, uh, and I want to spend a, a minute or two on this. 
This is from a paper by Chris Duras et al, uh, 2019. This is on mainly focused on the Buffalo Bowl Trench. So in this image, north is to the right, south is to the left. The ski area is where the Buffalo Bowl Trench was. Granite Canyon, there's Phillips Canyon up there. Lee Lake, uh, Steamboat Mountain, and then Antelope Flat off this, uh, off this image. So, um, so if we put those, here is that distance north to south, from right to left, north to south. There's Buffalo Bowl, Granite Canyon, and so forth. And these are the ages we have on earthquake events. So Buffalo Bowl, um, the, the, uh, the earlier event at Buffalo Bowl is, um, is sorry, I, I had to get my own time scale uh, checked out here, uh, 10,000 years to modern at the bottom. There's some reason that it's done this way. Um, so about 10,000 years ago, a, 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 a rupture event at Buffalo Bowl, about 8,000 years ago, and then about 4.6 thousand years ago, 3.9 to 5.7 thousand years ago. At Granite, Granite Canyon, 4.8 to 7.8, and then a, uh, a, a later event, um, uh, seven, or sorry, an older event, 7.9 to 8.4 thousand years, and then 4.8 to 7.8 thousand years ago. And then at Lee Lake, 6,000 years and 10,000 years, there's the age range. And, uh, and these are some uh, disturbance events of, of unknown source in the, the delta of the Snake River underneath Jackson Lake that I won't get back to. But uh, here at Steamboat Mountain, about 5,000 years and about 10,000 years up there. This may be a little unsatisfying, but uh, we have good constraint on this event at, at Steamboat Mountain. We're just getting ready to submit that for publication. So it's not been peer reviewed yet, so I'm being a little cagey about that. But about 5,000 years ago, I wanna call your attention to this event. 5,000 years ago, roughly, there was a, a rupture event in the north at Lee Lake, we, we think that this was right in this 5,000 year range, could have been a little bit older, but, uh, and then at Buffalo Bowl and at Granite Canyon, and, uh, and also expressed in the Jenny Lake record that I showed you earlier that, uh, that Darren Larson has. So it looks like around 5,000 years ago, there was the last big uh, rupture event on the fault. That doesn't mean it was the last earthquake in the area, means it was the last rupture on the Teton Fault that we can document in trenches. There's been nothing, no, no surface rupturing earthquake, earthquakes in 5,000 years. And that either means that things have gone very quiet or that things have been, uh, have been storing up for a while. The real problem is there may have been uh, quite a number of events early on, and then an event 5,000 years ago, and then nothing since then. So. This is, uh, we don't know how to interpret this. There are many ways to interpret this, this gap in earthquakes since 5,000 years ago. Um, so the last big event that we see in these trenches is around 5,000 years ago. I, we can't say for sure that they happened all at the same time. Our, uh, our range of ages is pretty wide here. We can't say for sure that they happened all at once but we can say that the, the information allows us to say that they might have happened all at once and that at times the uh, Teton Fault may rupture all at once or in close succession from, uh, from north to south. Several hundred, th sorry, several hundred years allowed here. So it could be decades apart or it could be all at once. There are other events that we only find in, in uh, the south. So it looks like at times, only the south ruptures, and, uh, and probably at times only the central section ruptures, and then at times the whole thing may rupture, and, and this is uh, really what we're looking at. So north, central, and south, and in the Jenny Lake record, we see a, uh, what looks like what must have been a, a, a rather large uh, fault rupture, and, um, and uh, this two and a half thousand year event, we don't know what to make of that, this is the only place that it's been documented so far as in uh, disturbance uh, sediments in the Snake River Delta that Ken Pierce looked at quite a number of years ago. All right, so there's, uh, there's the record as it stands. And uh, I wanna leave you with this image, the one that I started with, and uh, say that, um, 
this is an active fault. It's very clear that it's active. That's, that's not news. It's, a, uh, it's been known for a long time that it's very active. And uh, we're learning more of the specifics about when the earthquakes occurred. Um, what is the risk to Jackson Hole? Well, it's a long-term risk and, uh, and it's fairly sizable risk. Um, uh, fairly high magnitude earthquakes could occur on this fault. Uh, some of the previous estimates are, are around magnitude seven. Those have been in the, um, uh, in the National Seismic Hazard Map for a while. And uh, our results so far suggest that that is, is still a good number to use as an upper end. There, uh, there could very well be smaller events, uh, sizable, but smaller events as well. So, um, so the, the information that we've collected that, we, uh, that we're continuing to analyze, that information will, um, uh, will be put into a model that will then, then uh, develop those probabilities in more detail. And, and those are the sorts of things that are used for building codes and, and bridge building and, and uh, activities like that, which are long-term uh, long concerns. So I'm going to stop there and, um, and uh, I'm going to turn it over to John and uh, see if there are any questions out there. Okay, there, uh, Glenn, there are a couple here. Okay. And um, one would be, um, could the, uh, you may have answered this, but uh, could the activity in Jenny Lake from 18,000 years to seven and a half thousand years be partly due to unloading of the glaciers? Um, yes, uh, yes and no. And, and let me clarify what I, what I mean by that. Um, uh, in, in this case, we could be talking about about two glaciers, and I'll just use this, uh, use this particular image. There was the Yellowstone ice coming down through here. Um, there was also the ice um, that came down the valleys, that, that covered parts of the Teton range and came down the valleys. In terms of, um, of, of the crust rebounding, which crust does after glaciers leave, the Teton glaciers were too small to have much effect on that. They weren't, the, the total ice mass was not very large. They were sizable glaciers as we put them on a map, but not in terms of an ice mass. The Yellowstone ice was a regional ice mass though. And uh, about 20 years ago, a, um, a couple of German researchers produced some model results. These are well published. Uh, 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 a couple of papers have the, the first author of uh, Andrea uh, Hampel, I think is the name. And, uh, and their modeling, their, their modeling of the Yellowstone ice cap and the disappearance of the Yellowstone ice cap about 12 to 14,000 years ago suggests that that would have unloaded the crust regionally enough that the crust would have, uh, would have uh, the stress of that ice was, was quickly released. And, that, uh, and they, they suggested that that could cause more rapid motion of the Teton Fault shortly after deglaciation and then diminishing through time. That may very well be the case. It, it's uh, it's it, the, the current record, the record from Jenny Lake, and, uh, and Darren Larson will have more of these records coming out, uh, intra-lake uh, intra comparisons from Phelps and, uh, and uh, Taggart and other lakes. So there will be more of that story coming out that will help determine uh, if they're just Jenny Lake events, which I don't think they appear to be. Uh, we'll leave that to Darren, but, um, but unloading of the Yellowstone ice regionally may have had an effect on the Teton Fault and may have, may have contributed to that early activity, many events, and, uh, and also to the growth of that very large fault scarp that we see in places. So that may be what, gives us in part that large fault scarp. Doesn't help us with the, what has not been going on for the last 5,000 years. So we'll leave that for another day. All right, here's another one. Uh, do ground, ground monitors uh, tell us if the fault is moving apart or is static? Um, which maybe, uh, maybe we could translate that to uh, compressional versus extensional perhaps. Yes, um, I, I'm not privy to the current information on, uh, on uh, campaign uh, GPS surveys and so forth across the fault. 
Um, generally, it is in an extensional mode. That, that's clear from the long-term history of the fault. Um, from, uh, from the perspective, so the, the, the extension should still be continuing, and I believe it's been documented to be continuing, and there are others that can answer that question better than I can. Um, the other question would be, what do we learn from seismograph records? What we learn from seismograph records is that there's very little action on this fault. And uh, again, that can tell us one of two things. It can say either that it's not moving because uh, the stresses have been released. I wouldn't believe that for more than about 30 seconds, I think. And, uh, and the other is that the fault is locked. And, and, uh, and it's probably the latter that the fault is locked, it's building up stress, but uh, since the record has become less frequent over time, how that gets dealt with in terms of probabilities of rupture, the, the stresses should still be there, but how great they are is, uh, I think the jury is still out on that one. Okay, I, I can offer that uh, the University of Utah, Puskas uh, published on the uh -huh. GPS data, uh, some years ago, and uh, I, I presume it hasn't changed uh, in a couple of years. It's actually under compression across the Teton wow. Fault today, which is pretty unusual for an extensional fault. Um, and of course, we don't know how long that, how far that goes back. If you said, "Well, maybe it went back five thousand years," uh, there's why there's no activity. <laughs> Could be just pushing, pushing right back there. And, uh, and, and I, think, uh, I think the Tetons, like a lot of these active faults, are pretty ripe for, uh, for new surveys. Um, the ability to measure uh, very, uh, very minute uh, ground motions are, uh, are much greater. And uh, that, that's been quite a number of years since that was published, I believe. And John, you can correct me, but, uh, but I think uh, a recollection of, the, of that information would be good. And there are yeah. people who would probably like to do that. Yeah, well, the GPS data, is, I think, is uh, probably ongoing, mm -hmm. but I haven't seen real real recent stuff published on that. No. Here's uh, something. Uh, Ken Pierce said that he wants to know whether Jenny Lake shows turbidite deposits from fourteen to 7,000 years ago, and why uh, aren't there as many events recently as in the early Holocene? <laughs> I, I think, uh, I, did you say that was Ken Pierce? Yeah, I thought I would okay. let you know who asked this one. Right, well, good, good, good to know who, uh, who's, who's listening in here. And uh, I'll, I'll let Ken cr uh, uh, correct my various mistakes on glacial chronology as well. But um, uh, the, uh, I, I think that um, there, are, there are a couple of things that are clear from those lake records. One that's clear is that those are, those are clearly uh, basin-wide uh, uh, turbidite deposits, meaning basin-wide within Jenny Lake. And, uh, and so they are, they are event horizons, as they would be called, because they're anomalous in the, in the, in the uh, lake record, right? And, um, and so, I think the uh, I, I think the question would be: Are some of the early ones because there was a lot of sediment coming out of the range after the glaciers departed? Be a lot of sediment sitting around. Uh, was there just a, more sediment coming out into the lakes early after the glaciers backed off? And uh, and that uh, for that reason, Darren has been coring other lakes, and I think we'll know more about that when he comes through with that record. So. Uh, so they are. Uh, that is a good uh, a, a good record of turbidites, clearly, and maybe a seismic disturbance record, and maybe not just the Teton Fault. So, um, but from fourteen to seventeen, from sorry, from fourteen to seven thousand years, there was a lot going on on the floor of Jenny Lake, and um, and uh, that'll be Darren's story to tell, uh, hopefully, fairly soon. Okay, well, what, one last question then here. Um, are there any preservation issues of the earthquake ruptures in the trenches? Or if the fault ruptures, should we you know, inevitably see it in the trench? Okay, uh, two good questions there. And, and I would say um, the, the, uh, really the most important question there is, are there ruptures of the Teton Fault 
that aren't expressed at, at all at the surface. And, um, and, and there are two, two ways of looking at that. One is, uh, do they break the surface and do we see that rupture in the landforms? And the answer is, very, there's a very good chance there are earthquake events that we do not see in the, in the landscape or in our trenches. And um, if, a, uh, if, a, if a fault is ruptured at the surface, that usually occurs in earthquakes that are six or greater magnitude. So on the Richter scale or the moment magnitude scale, six or greater is, um, uh, is required to rupture the surface. Not every earthquake six or larger will rupture the surface, but that's what's required to rupture the surface. So it would be a big earthquake. If we see it in the trenches, it was a, it was a sizable earthquake. That's the general uh, understanding of that. There's a very good chance that there are ruptures that we do not see in the trenches because they're smaller ruptures, relieving stress at depth, and uh, they just don't make it to the surface. There's, there's a very good chance of that. And um, this is one of the questions in the, in the sawtooths in central Idaho right now with the recent earthquakes. Um, there's, there's no clear evidence of, of ground breakage. It was a 6.5 earthquake. Um, the, a lot of the aftershocks certainly aren't breaking the surface, but um, so there's a good chance then the Teton record and, and uh, Darren Larson's record might pick those events up because they would generate strong shaking where the fault trenches would not. So really we're after in inner comparison of the two records, they could very well be telling us two different things. All right. Um, so thanks for all that, Glenn. And in conclusion, um, let me just say a couple of things. We don't have to move chairs tonight. So uh, we don't have to stack things on the side of the auditorium. Um, this is part of the, you know, the library's ongoing Science Nature Tuesday evening programs. And uh, there are a couple things still scheduled. So next week, Bird Nature Club has a great talk on, by Brian Bedrosian on the Great Gray Owls. And on June 16th, um, Geologist of Jackson Hall uh, has Darren Larson from Northwestern University talking about uh, way out there, the Milky Way, uh, which will be really great stuff. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, we, I'm not going to unmute everybody, but uh, I would just like to say that I'm sure, uh, Glenn, everybody appreciates your, your, your providing us uh, this talk. We know we've taken up your evening here, and you know, we thank you for putting this all together, and we'll look forward to having you back in person one of these days. So <laughs> thank you very, very much, Glenn. Okay, and thank you all, and uh, it's, uh, it's amazing to see 60 to 80 people uh, showing up for a virtual presentation. That's excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, thanks. And everybody, uh, you know, join next, next Tuesday and then on June 16th. Thanks. Thanks a bunch again, Glenn.